Have you ever been asked the question, is faith a gift of God? As Paul said to the church in Corinth, what do you have that you did not receive? The truth is, all we are able to do can be seen as a gift from God. For example, what if I were to ask you, is your next breath a gift from God? You would say, of course it is. But aren't you still responsible for how you use your next breath to praise him or to curse him? What if I were to ask, is a great singer's ability to sing a gift from God? Of course it is. But isn't a singer responsible for how he uses the gift God has given him, for good or for evil? The question, is faith a gift from God, is the wrong question when it comes to the dispute that we have with our Calvinistic friends. To get to our actual point of contention, one must ask this question instead. Is faith an effectual or irresistible gift of God, only given to some and withheld from all others? The answer to that question is emphatically, no, it's not. The Bible clearly teaches that all people are without excuse for their unbelief, but the Calvinistic doctrine teaches that mankind cannot believe unless God gives them an effectual or irresistible gift of faith. This way of thinking can lead some people astray. For example, one influential Calvinist who has now become an atheist gives this testimony. Hmm. And with my Christian friends who try to convince me of this, I say, listen, like I don't know why you're trying to persuade me. Hmm. Because your own Bible says it's a gift. that it's a gift, it's the work of the Spirit start to finish, it's, a, it's the, a removing of a heart of stone or replacing with a heart of flesh. That is not something you can do for me. Yeah. So if it's true, we're both depending on the Spirit to show yeah. up. I'm literally in the grave next to Lazarus yeah. waiting, for the to hear, waiting, waiting to hear my name. Yeah. And I'm going to lay in there dead till he shows up. There's a point where I said, you know what, maybe, maybe God made me and fashioned me for destruction. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, vessel for Cause he, cause he, Cause he says he does that. Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated, through, for the good pleasure of his own will. That's right. And, and he receives no counsel but his own about yep. that. And so there's nothing I'm going to be able to do to change his mind about it. So maybe it's all real and I'm just not chosen. Is Derek right? Could it be that he was created for destruction? Could it be that he was chosen for reprobation and that God really doesn't love him or desire for his salvation? Is salvation more like Lazarus being called from the grave who has absolutely nothing to do with it, which the Bible never links to soteriology, by the way? Or is he more dead like the prodigal son, one who's living in rebellion to the Father, but is responsible to humble himself, come from his pigsty, and return home? If faith is an irresistible gift only given by God to some people and not others, then why did Jesus rebuke them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen, as recorded in Mark 16, 14? Why did he rebuke his audience, saying, You unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you? Why ask this question, if ultimately God is the one who's deciding if they believe or not? Shouldn't Jesus say instead, how long shall God withhold the effectual gift that he has to give to you in order for you to believe? Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith, according to Mark 6.6. 6. How does that make any sense if Calvinism is true? Imagine being amazed that people can't breathe underwater when they're born unable to breathe underwater, and you have the only breathing apparatus that you have to give them irresistibly in order for them to breathe. We also see in Luke 7, 9, when Jesus heard about the Roman centurion, and he turns to the crowd and says, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. If I am the one responsible for giving this man his breathing apparatus, then why would I be amazed that he is breathing and the others who I refuse to give the apparatus to are not? The confusion comes from a misinterpretation of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for instance, we read from Calvinistic pastor John Piper, quote, So when Paul says, By grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from you, it is the gift of God, part of his meaning is that our faith is a gift of God, and it's a divine creation. It is the work of grace when we were dead. It is not from ourselves. Therefore, our faith is the mark of being chosen by God. He chose to give us faith, end quote. 
Dr. William Lane Craig, a leading theologian and apologist, explains the error of this Calvinistic reading. Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not because of works, lest any man should boast. Doesn't this show that faith is simply God's gift to you and not something that you do on your own? I think that's incorrect, uh, and I think demonstrably so. The antecedent of this is not the word faith. You would have to have a feminine pronoun in order to refer to faith. Rather, what the word this refers to is the whole preceding clause, namely, salvation by grace through faith. That is not your own doing. This is the gift of God. This is the way God has elected to set it up. Most Greek scholars agree that on a grammatical level, it is doubtful that either faith or grace is the antecedent of tuto. It may surprise some to learn that even John Calvin agrees with this interpretation, saying, quote, and here we must advert to a very common error in the interpretation of this passage. Many persons restrict the word gift to faith alone, but Paul is only repeating, in other words, the former sentiment. His meaning is not that faith is the gift of God, but that salvation is given to us by God or that we obtain it by the gift of God." End quote. So even if we were to concede to our Calvinistic friends that faith in some sense of the word is a gift from God in the same way that our next breath is a gift from God or any ability that we have is ultimately from the Father, it simply does not ever say in the scripture that faith is irresistibly given to some people and withheld from all others. The Bible says in Romans 10:17 faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. The Bible often speaks about God granting the ability to come to Jesus or to believe or to repent, but granting does not mean to effectually or irresistibly cause something. It never has. It never will. For instance, in Acts 11:18, they rejoice, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God granted repentance that leads to life. Does that mean that all the Gentiles believed and repented? Of course not. It simply means that the Gentiles were given the means by which they too may repent and believe. As Paul explained in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Thus, God grants faith and repentance first to the Jew by bringing them the gospel, and then to the Gentile by bringing them the gospel. As Hebrews 4, 2 says, For we have heard the good news, just as they did. They heard the message, but it did them no good, because when they heard it, they did not accept it with faith. No one lacks what is necessary for their salvation. God is not withholding the necessary gift of faith from some people leaving them without hope of salvation. Paul taught us that those who perish only perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. And he taught Timothy, this is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Remember to like and share this video and subscribe to the channel. For more on this topic, visit Soteriology101.com.